I watched a video by Sir Sugarmeat on YouTube about teaching Generation Alpha and I was not prepared for the rabbit hole I was about to go down. Now for clarity, generations don't seem to have specific origins or names and dates, but they're used in conversation anyway. For this conversation, millennials between 27 and 44, Generation Z or Z between 12 and 27, then Generation Alpha 12 and younger. For 2024 at least. YouTube commentary added loads of different claims to suck up my time, but Generation Alpha can't read. That was the one that piqued my interest the most. I kept seeing these same TikToks over and over again saying Generation Alpha can't read. Many of these YouTube commentaries were adding claims about gentle parenting and online content, but nothing about the reading. Were teachers doing something wrong? Was the educational science being followed? Or is Generation Alpha just unteachable. That's the narrative I kept sort of seeing. The tragedy of Generation Alpha. So I went looking for more context. Some have argued it's like this for every generation. It's the old people complaining about the young. And although I don't know who originally said this, this quote supposedly predates most of us alive now. What is happening to our young people? They disrespect their elders, they disobey their parents, they ignore the law, they riot in the streets inflamed with wild notions. Their morals are decaying. What is to become of them? Sounds similar to some of the uh, claims about Generation Alpha. But in spite of this, teachers are saying no. Actually, we have it worse right now. And this issue isn't isolated. It is countrywide, in this case, America. But having recently read through the PISA 2022 report that was released at the end of 2023, it assesses 15-year-olds' mathematical reasoning, reading proficiency, and scientific inquiry. Reading it, I got the impression the American reading proficiency was actually increasing not decreasing. The pandemic was brought up as a reason for the reading scores to be decreasing. Now, it's likely a factor for the decreased performance scores in the OECD countries and economies for the PISA testing, but there was a steady decline of performance scores before the pandemic, and narrowing in on the American PISA scores, the scores in 2022 are very similar to the scores in the year 2000. So not only does this suggest the American 15-year-olds are no better or worse, but also the pandemic didn't impact the students as much as potentially claimed. Some people mention the PISA scores, but from blog posts, not raw data, or use data from the 2018 or 2015 results, not the recent 2022 results. And although PISA is great for an overview, it's for 15 year olds, which is not Generation Alpha. So the first thing I considered about these claims was that the children just don't care about the tests in the classroom. The claims seen and discussed on social media are from teachers in the classrooms, not standardized tests or state testing. However, some of the people discussing this did use standardized test stats in their discussions. Side note here, those that don't like standardized testing or don't want standardized testing were using standardized tests to evidence their claims, which seems to go against their educational philosophy. If we shouldn't use standardized tests to compare students between one another, then why are you using standardized tests to compare generation stats between one another? It, it just seems odd. Something else I noticed about the people discussing this is either they didn't use sources, they used outdated sources, unverified data, incorrect numbers. So I'm really just going from the teacher experiences here and specifically teachers speaking on social media, which obviously has a biased sample group. But going back to the standardized test scores, the composite ACT score, American College Testing Score, was used in quite a few of these discussions. But from what I can see, it isn't reading. It is math, English, reading, and science. Separating English and reading was an interesting note, but when I look at the PISA scores, the mathematical reasoning score decreased, whereas the reading slightly increased for the American students. So the ACT scores decreasing might not be the reading proficiency or decreased reading, but the decreased math. Or students could be getting worse at those types of tests because teachers could be teaching something else, more modern skills. There was also a 65% stat also kept coming up. 65% of grade four students are not proficient in reading. Nine to 10 year olds, so generation alpha. And after finally finding the blog, then the article, then the report that this number actually comes from, it said, in in 2019, some 35% of fourth grade students and 34% of eighth grade students performed at or above NAEP proficient, the National Assessment of Educational Progress. So not only is the data for almost five years old, it is also before the pandemic, which sort of reduces those pandemic claims and also looks at proficient reading, not 
basic. Taking a look at the 2022 scores very quickly, 37% of fourth graders performed below NAEP basic in reading, and 30% of eighth grade students performed below NAEP basic in reading. 13 and 14 years old, so borderline generation alpha. Levels are going from below basic, basic, proficient, advanced. Whereas the PISA report uses eight different levels of reading proficiency. So the NAEP stats have four different levels, each with a different name. So when being reading proficient according to the NAEP levels, that could actually be harder than the baseline level of reading proficiency according to PISA. That being said, NAEP grades still got worse by 2% in the four years. But if you zoom out and look back to 1992, the scores are very similar. 33% at or above NAEP proficient compared to 29% at or above NAEP proficient. Some of the parents of Generation Alpha weren't even born at that point, so although 65% looks bad, the scores are actually very similar and the percentage is actually up, which could suggest NAEP scores are very similar to the PISA scores. Then when looking at all of the numbers, the percentages are very similar to the early 2000s. So testing doesn't seem to say anything significant about the claims about Gen Alpha not being able to read, at least not significantly worse than previous years. But one parent discussing this said, actually, no, it's the educational system's fault. Again, I'm not sure what the symptom is for there to be a fault, but I went to have a look at the podcast anyway, and I heard sight words come up. And this is where I thought I was getting somewhere because I'd heard sight words come up in one of the TikTok explanations as well. As someone with limited expertise in early years education, I did want to check that I understood what sight words were. So, sight words are words that students are expected to recognize instantly. Words like the, once, come, walk. Words that don't follow phonic rules. The ability to break up words into sounds from letters or combinations of letters. And the teacher on TikTok argues sight words are being taught too much. That's why Gen Alpha can't read. Which got me thinking about two different things. If sight words are words that don't follow phonic rules, how do students learn how to read words that aren't sight words. Either they aren't taught, taught rarely, which I imagine would be very difficult considering most words can be broken down into letters or combinations of letters, like phonics, sounding out the letters and combinations of letters, or teachers make non-sight words into sight words. Students learning to recognize words rather than learning how to read the words. This would then make memorization somewhat central to the ability to read. An educational philosophy that has lots of limitations very well documented in the educational science literature. So teaching students to read by memorizing answers might not be an ideal philosophy for long-term learning of the skill. The second thing is that these non-sight words into sight words also was extended by the reading recovery program the podcast was talking about. This new program found lots of success and was adopted by lots of different teachers. The theory, emphasis on theory, was that children can learn naturally without sounding out each part of the word, which sounds like sight words, but in practice not quite. According to the podcast, in practice, this program ended up with children guessing the next word in a sentence. Not really reading the sentence, leading to lots and lots of mistakes. Phonics teaching, however, to my understanding, gets children going through sequences or addressing sounds as they come to them. So teaching fundamentals, done with explicit instruction, i.e. being told what the word, letter, or combination of letters sounds like, or implicit instruction, where they try and figure out out what it is and then get some feedback, either through sounding out the parts of the words and then putting them together, or sounding out the word as a whole. Sight words. Phonics teachers let me know if I'm misunderstanding or missing something. But educational theories evolve all of the time. However, as mentioned in this podcast episode, when Dan Corcoran was a little boy in the 1950s, no one really understood how people read or how little kids learn to do it. There were theories but no one really knew for sure. Since then, there's been a huge amount of research, thousands of studies, and what was once a big mystery is now common knowledge among cognitive scientists and psychologists and other researchers who study how people learn. But it's not common knowledge among teachers. And that is what interests me. 
why my initial thoughts lack of teacher education time resources communication of the science understanding of the academic literature but in this specific case i think it's the application of a theory to practice where the practitioner i.e the educator may not evolve their practice with the theory or the practitioner is not effectively applying the theory in practice i.e the teacher's not putting the theory in practice the way it was intended and the podcast went on to discuss how reading and spoken language teaching are different. One question was, is reading the same as listening and speaking? And in particular, do human beings learn written language the same way they learn spoken language? And the clear answer to that was no. And although I agree, they are learned differently, as they are different skills, we can still use the same educational philosophies in teaching them. They say something else about the theories which may explain the different approaches we take. Research shows that human beings are born with brains that are wired to acquire spoken language. No one has to teach us how to talk. We learn to talk by being talked to. And that assumption, humans being wired to learn to speak but not read, to me is problematic. They say we don't need teachers to help us talk, but there are loads of people that need teachers to help us talk for various reasons. And if we want to learn a different language, we need a teacher or we need to teach ourselves. Children brought up in the wild by animals, the wild child situations, they also need a teacher to help them teach. It's not hardwired in their brains to learn how to speak. We learn through experience or empiricism, and that's the same for reading, speaking, and learning literally anything. But their wild assumption builds up their philosophy about how we teach to read. This process of connecting the pronunciation of a word with its spelling and its meaning is critical. It's how your brain stores the written form of a word in your memory. You are born with a brain that can remember the pronunciation of words and the meaning of words. And as you connect the pronunciation and meaning of words with their spelling, you create new neural pathways that allow you to remember written words. Now, this again is in theory, things being stored in memory, and that comes from cognitive psychology. But there are lots of different ways to interpret those theories and then put those theories into practice. And then there's also ecological psychology, which takes a fundamentally different approach to the way that you would teach. So I'm not sure this is an educational system problem, rather different philosophical approaches on how to teach. That can and has been debated for years and will continue to be debated because people will take different approaches. But philosophical differences in educators doesn't really explain why the teachers are claiming that Generation Alpha can't read. This is where intelligence gets thrown into the mix. Gen Alpha can't read, they must be dumb. Generation Alpha are getting dumber. But again, if you take a step back, measuring intelligence through IQ tests, as Derek Muller from Veritasium explored well in his video, IQ can't be estimated by innate or environmental factors. The assumption that reading is hardwired, somewhat challenged again, but also supporting the idea that intelligence is diverse. That's where you can bring fluid intelligence, crystallized intelligence into the conversation, or multiple intelligence theory, or emotional intelligence. There are so many different types of theories involving intelligence that when you look at IQ tests alone, the point is that IQ tests appear to objectively measure intelligence, but they don't. Even in the same country, separated only by time, cultural changes can affect the average scores on IQ tests. And again, the reason I bring intelligence up is because Gen Alpha are being accused of being dumb. Now granted, many of the commentaries could be joking or exaggerating things a little bit meant for entertainment. But if we have lots of people saying the same sorts of things without challenging it or at least adding in nuance, it can become widely believed and potentially leading to those in policy to make policy changes or potentially changing things which could have bigger and larger consequences on schools like resources and funding and teacher education. Along Alongside the fairly obvious impact it will have on teacher and student well-being accusing certain generations or teachers being dumb or bad. And when we do zoom out and look at intelligence levels, yes, Gen Alpha has decreased, but so have lots of other age groups. The Flynn effect looks to describe the increase in intelligence levels or IQ tests over time, but the negative or reverse Flynn effect 
looked at the decrease. A meta-analysis, study of studies, said they allow us to conclude that there is a continuous decline in IQ scores over time and that this is a real phenomenon and not simply a blip. Going on to say, if there truly is a trend towards declining intelligence as indicated by a negative Flynn effect, then this would be a phenomenon with potentially serious implications. Suggesting that it isn't Gen Alpha, but all ages. Then again, it comes down to the tests being taken. If you test highly effective workers on skills they don't use, the results are likely going to be poor. One of the reasons the OECD Compass Framework looks at developing competencies and student agency rather than looking at test results. Gen Alpha, or just students in general, might not be getting good test results because of what the work they do isn't related to the tests. Autocorrect was brought up as a reason why Gen Alpha can't spell, but it is the same for most people. If a skill isn't required to survive because of technology or just them not needing it, what is the reason, the motivation, the goal for that person to learn the skill? Personal experience here, I was told and taught how to write and format a letter to post while I was at school. I failed my English tests on those things because I didn't see the point in learning how to write and post a letter. Text? Email or phoning is and was far quicker. Now, if I do need to send something, I'll look at the internet to make sure it gets to where it needs to go, but I learn how to do it when there is a reason. Unless someone is using paper or pen or doesn't have autocorrect on their device, why would they need to learn the skill of spelling all of these different words? Pass the test. Assuming they are reading back what they are writing, the words need to be somewhat accurate, or they need to understand it at least. If they're not reading it back or understanding what they've written, then I would argue it's more drawing than writing, but let me know your thoughts in the comments. And to be clear, I'm not saying spelling and grammar isn't important. It obviously is. But unless you understand why you need to learn those skills, why would you? Reading academic text is a skill you could learn. But sounding out the words, the heavy jargon, and understanding the meaning behind the words is still learning how to read. But most people don't need to learn how to read complex academic texts full of jargon so they don't learn. The same could be said for the children, except it's basic text. Unless there is a reason to learn it, why would they? So those teachers, those parents, those educators, or anyone else involved in teaching those children, are they giving the student a reason to learn? Apart from to pass the test. Maybe the reason is follow the instructions to play a game, or an explanation on how to get their toy back from being hidden, or a, an easter egg type hunt game thing to find something. Or for them to read background stories about characters they like watching on TV. I hated reading as a kid. I said the words that were in the book while my mum listened, but I remember looking at the number more than anything else. I need to read 10 pages and then I can go play sport or do literally anything else. I I didn't know what I was reading, just that the sounds I was making must have been right until I was stopped and then told to sound a different word. Needless to say, English was one of my worst subjects at school, but when I had a reason to learn to read, my interest in educational science, I became pretty competent at it. The first book I read from page one all the way through, and could actually remember any significant details about it, was a textbook about becoming a sports coach, which I read at 19. An academic textbook was the first book I actually Red? And this is where I would love to ask those those teachers making the claims about co-agency in the classroom. I find this diagram from the OECD documentation useful for those unfamiliar. But essentially, co-agency is the level to which the child and all the other people are engaged in making decisions and participation about learning together. I imagine the teacher-student ratio is difficult to manage, but for those students that can't read, how much agency or control or decision is up to them about the lessons or projects that they are told to do. My suspicion is that they are just expected to do as they are told and follow the rest of the class with limited input into what it is that they're actually doing to learn how to read. Looking at the accompanying table, maybe hovering around the tokenism level, appearing to give young people choice, but not really acting on it. As the OECD documentation stated, the stronger the degree of co-agency, the better for the well-being of both students and adults. You could also bring in theories about self-determination, autonomy, and the four C's of competence, confidence, connection, and character in educational settings, but to be clear, this isn't teacher-student. 
There's also peers and parents and loads of other stakeholders involved in the learning experiences. So the 37% below basic or 66% below proficient students, what is their reason to learn? And how much choice are they given in the lessons and projects that they're engaging in to actually learn the skill of how to read? Of course, this is a multifactorial situation, but considering those two points, I think could explain some of the experiences that are being shared in these TikTok conversation, specifically thinking about these students that are struggling. But the more I looked into these discussions, the more I kept hearing reading and comprehension being used somewhat interchangeably. But what does comprehend mean? Recognize the words, put meaning to sentences, have understanding of the sentences, and is that deep or shallow understanding? Epistemology is the philosophical study of knowledge and those words, knowledge, understanding, comprehension, can have drastically different meanings. Someone's level of expertise will change their level of understanding something. The child may understand or comprehend something better than the adult in a specific context because of their level of expertise. Online content and dynamics being something I think about. But I think in this context, combining those words, reading comprehension is gaining meaning from words. But if they're not familiar with the words, it might not mean anything to them, like me reading a foreign language. I could read out the words and it might sound right, it might sound wrong, but I have no meaning to put to those words. And that's similar to the academic jargon. I could read the words out, it might sound right, it might not, but I may not have meaning or understand the meaning of those words. So proficient readers, as Pisa describes, is understanding text or identifying the main ideas, interpreting and evaluating, considering author's purpose, tone and perspective, synthesizing information, so drawing Drawing conclusions from multiple sources, then applying knowledge, so following instructions normally. For people with less expertise, typically younger, I would expect the focus to be on identifying the main ideas, then applying the knowledge. Note I said less expertise because there are older children and adults that struggle to read. There is a reason readability scores are low in the majority of online content. The average reading age in the world is around 9 to 13, but people are still literate, they can read and write, but the skills of potential adults could be matched by children around 9 to 13. And again I want to emphasize, if they don't need to learn how to read or write complex academic texts, why would they learn to? Which brings me back to the ranking and comparisons this discussion is really about. Testing and grading students, then comparing them to their peers or people in the past. My day, if I didn't turn in an assignment, I had a zero. If I turned something in two weeks late, I could have lost 30 points on that assignment. Back in those days, grades actually mattered. <laughs> they actually determine whether you passed or failed, which is not a thing anymore. Grades determining if you pass or fail is not a thing anymore. I'm gonna have to come back to that. But to me, it sounds like the tests have limited consequences. Not punishment, but a result or effect. Normally unwelcome. To maybe students getting poor results have more constrained practice focused on basic reading skills. Students getting better results having more degrees of freedom inside of their practice design. For transparency, my understanding of the American education system is limited, but I think the state and districts can have different policy. So test consequences will vary and also holding back students will vary across states and districts and likely schools. Not that holding back students seems to be that beneficial. Pisa says we should provide additional support to struggling students instead of requiring them to repeat a grade. But those tests that are taken aren't apparently needed in some places in America. But it is so bad now that you have states that are quite literally getting rid of the requirement for reading, writing, and math for graduating, which means you can graduate as a student without having met any academic standards in those three categories and they'll just send you on your way. But again, diving deeper, I feel that's misleading. For clarity, this is high school graduation, that's at 18 I believe, but could be older if they're held back or younger if they're moved forward. And Oregon was a popular example of these skills not being needed to graduate, one person saying, Oregon high school diploma will be no guarantee that the student who earned it can read, write, or do math at a high school level. But Oregon emphasizes essential learning skills, which are in classes the students need to take to graduate, which includes read and comprehend text, 
write clearly and accurately, apply mathematics in a variety of settings, alongside further explanations, descriptions, and other skills. So the claims students aren't tested is oversimplified. The claims grades don't matter is inaccurate. The claims students are dumb seems to lack nuance in the data. The claims Gen Alpha can't read just seems sensationalized. That's not to say I don't think educational systems have room for improvement. They certainly do. Or that some educators couldn't do with updating their educational philosophy or understanding the science a little bit deeper because they certainly could do. But if we're going to compare generations and their abilities, we should look at the full context of the conversation. So I don't think Generation Alpha are doomed. They are just like the rest of us, learning from our experiences. Those individuals struggling may needing a reassessment of their learning experiences that they're gaining at school, at home and everywhere else. But again, <laughs> that's a huge conversation. I do want to say thank you to anyone contributing to the conversation inside of the comment section or inside of the Discord where we go a little bit deeper inside of the research. But if you do want to support what we do, there is a link in the description below.